glad that you're here, whether you're online or not. Um, we're just glad that you're here. A lot of you um, join us from different parts of the country, which is interesting. And it's not because of HGTV, I don't think. Um, but I'm just glad you're here and a part of something because that's what we're learning during this season is that uh, you don't have to be in a room necessarily to, to be a part of something. Now, we're trying to figure out what that does look like and how you can be involved in um, discipleship and small groups and service in your area, but you're a part of this, and so we're just glad that you're here. Um, but before I jump into today's message, this is the last week um, of just a short series of talking about John the Baptist, um, but before we jump into that, I want to talk for just a second, if you'll bear with me, about faith. Um, because here's something that you'll learn along the way, if you haven't already, is at some point in your life, you'll learn that one of the most difficult things about having faith is struggling with having doubt. Let me, let me say it this way. Um, it just would be really nice. It'd be easy, you know, to have faith if you just never had any doubt, right? I mean, it just seems to make sense. It's like, well, yeah, that, that's kind of the point. That's the idea. But, but watch this. But then again, that really wouldn't require having faith. Right? I mean, okay, follow my logic here. This is just where my brain works, okay? So it's like, it's almost like you have to have doubt in order to have an exercise faith. There's not an opportunity to have faith in something if there is no room for doubt. Does that make sense? But, but unfortunately, because for, for, for most of us, it's the doubt that causes us to struggle with faith. You know, and it's like this paradox. It kind of goes back and forth. And it sounds like, well, if I could just not have any doubt, then faith would be so easy, but then there wouldn't be a need for faith. And, and yet that's what we long for, especially as North American Christians. You know, we just, we almost idolize certainty. We want things to be certain, and we're not going to buy it, we're not going to get into it, we're not going to jump into it, we're not going to believe it. If I can't know that it's 100% and it's true and it, we're confident in that, and, and, but truthfully, if we're, if we're all being honest, there's no such thing. I mean, it's a myth. I mean, there's no such thing as 100% certainty really about much of anything in this life. Life just doesn't work that way. It throws us curveballs all the time, and we never really know what to expect yet. And so we find ourselves struggling. And so here's where faith becomes such an issue. Our faith begins to rise and fall. It ebbs and flows based on how we interpret our circumstances. And here's the thing about that. We're not real good at interpreting our circumstances like none of us are. We like to think we are, but, but we're just not. And the reason that we struggle with this is because we, we come at everything with presuppositions. In other words, <clears throat> you know, when you're young, you just kind of get told what to believe, and so you believe it. You don't really ask questions. But then as you get older, and it doesn't take long, you start questioning things, and you start having some doubts and some concerns, and you're just wondering, well, I've got... You know, I presume some things. And, and as you get older, the older you get, the greater those presuppositions are. You make some assumptions and you begin to apply those as like a grid or a filter when you're looking at what's going on in your world, right? Because you've just kind of predecided what is true about something, how something is going to feel, what it's going to mean. And, and so... <clears throat> When something happens in your life, then you just, you just look through that grid and that is, you know, the truth. You've just decided what the truth is, okay? And so let, let me give an example of this because, because it's also true that the more serious, the more serious the circumstance, the more inclined we are to misinterpret our circumstances. Let me explain. Um, so just a, just kind of a, a silly uh, scenario here. Just imagine, and we've all kind of been there. If you drive, you've lost your keys at some point. Anybody lost their keys besides Leroy and my wife? <laughs> it just happens. Um, but let's just say you lose your keys, and you're a good Christian. So, I mean, you, you throw up a little prayer. You know, it's like, oh, God, I'm late for this meeting. And God, would you just help me? I, I, I need to find my keys Heavenly Father, I know that you're about the big things and the small things, and so I just, I just come to you. I need to find my keys. And let's just say maybe you find your keys. And so what do you do? It's like, oh, God, thank you so much. Like, I'm not going to be late. Okay. And you offer that up, and it's not a problem. Thank you, God. You, you did that. You, you, brought, you, you magically brought my keys back. It was amazing. It was a miracle. 
But let's just assume for a second that you didn't find your keys and you were still late for work or you didn't make it to work or you know, and you were really frustrated and you did get angry. But I'm just going to guess that you probably didn't start blaming God and pointing your finger and saying, that's it, I'm walking away from faith. I couldn't find my keys. Anybody? Probably not. Because it's like, well, we know better than that. I mean, come on, it was my keys. Like, what's the big deal? Okay, but let's take the same kind of logic and apply it to a serious circumstance. Let's say a tragedy happened, you know, and maybe the loss of a loved one or a marriage is falling apart or somebody's sick or there's a chronic illness or there's a diagnosis, prognosis, and it's not looking good. Things are not not good. And so what do you do? Well, you pray about those things. <clears throat> you pray, God, would you... Would you step into this situation? Because, you know, do what only you can do because I'm at a loss. And, and let's just say that a miracle happens and <clears throat> suddenly the person is healed or there's, you know, it's just unbelievable that the marriage is restored and you just thought there was no way. And it's unbelievable. And you just say, thank you, God, so much for stepping in and intervening. You, thank you. But, but let's just say that it doesn't happen. The miracle doesn't happen. Maybe things go from bad to worse, and it actually gets much worse than it, than it was to begin with. And, and you know now it's not like just not finding your keys. Well, now you, you're getting frustrated. You're getting angry. And you may even begin to point your finger and say, God, where were you? I knew, God, are you serious? I prayed about this. I've been faithful, and, and you can do something. You are the God of the universe. Are you serious? Like, if you're really God, then what happened? You could have stepped in. You could have done something about this. Why, why didn't you? You ever felt that way? And maybe we begin to lose faith. Maybe that's happened to some of you at some point in your life. Maybe you're going through a season like that right now, and you just, you just are questioning. It's like, I don't understand, and you're struggling with doubt, and you're struggling with those concerns and those questions. And so now you're kind of looking at God and you're going, you're, you're applying those presuppositions about what God should or shouldn't have done. You didn't bother with it when it came to your keys. But when it comes to this situation, it's like, God, you, you should have done something. And so now you're just wondering, well, I mean, if God is really listening, why doesn't he, why, why does he seem so inattentive? If God is really present, why does he seem absent? If God is really powerful, why does he seem inactive? If God is really love... Why, why does he seem so uncaring, unconcerned? Where, where is God in all of this? And here's the thing. Um, those are tough questions to answer. And we have those questions sometimes. And, and, and I've been there. Like, I've experienced that. And you've, I, I'm just telling you, I know exactly what you're feeling because you kind of feel at a loss. You feel like you're, you're kind of left... Uh, left in the middle of nowhere, and there's no way out, and th- it doesn't look like the situation's going to get any better, what, whatever the situation is, whatever circumstance. But sometimes when I'm walking through seasons like that, <clears throat> I just want to know that somebody's experienced this before. I want to know that somebody understands what I'm going through. That, I mean, because it just helps sometimes. That's why we have community. You know, we just want to know that, you know, ha- have you been through this before? What do I do? How do I handle this? And I mean, that's why this is so important. Well, I also like to look at Scripture because if I can go to Scripture, you know, because I'm a good Christian, and so it's like I want to, I just want to know, like, is it in here? Has anybody ever felt this way before, or am I just being ridiculous? And sure enough, I mean, this, I, you know, uncertainty and doubt and questions all throughout Scripture. I mean, it is painted all throughout Scripture, but especially in the New Testament Gospels, specifically. A guy that we've been looking at the last couple of weeks, his name is John. His name is John. And it's not John. I mean, he struggled with this for sure. We just didn't, you know, you just don't see it sometimes when you look at his life. But John, not as in John, the writer of the gospel of John, but John as in John the Baptist, not John the Methodist, but John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer. That's how he was known because he was a baptizer. It's like John, the guy that baptizes people. And so that's kind of how he was known. But here's what's so amazing. His life was so specifically geared toward a very unique purpose that he had been given. And it was to call out the one who was to come, to prepare the way for the Messiah. And so he ended up being kind of a missing link, the link between the Old Testament and the New Testament. He is the figure that bridges the gap between the teachings of the you know, Old Testament prophecies and you know, the law and the prophets, so to speak, and then the teachings that Jesus is the Son of God, he's the one that kind of bridged the gap and paved the way. And so that's who we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. But, but I want to 
I want to look specifically at this purpose that he had been given because it really helps, and I want to really flesh this out because I think it helps paint the picture for the struggle that he had and how familiar we are with some of the feelings that, that John was having. And so John came, and it was a miraculous birth, really, um, because his parents were really old and they couldn't have kids. They had never had kids. They had wanted to have kids, but they didn't. And then in their old age, an angel had visited and said, hey, you're going to have a son. And they even told him what his name was going to be and what he was going to do. And then sure enough, they had a son and his name was John. And the whole point was for him to come along and to point out the Messiah, to point to Jesus. And sure enough, John did just that. In fact, he was so convinced of this that he himself said this, I have seen and I testify that this is pointing at Jesus, God's chosen one. This is the man. He's the chosen one. Now that's, you know, it's like, okay, that's what we've been saying the last couple of weeks, but why is that significant? Okay. So like, let's look at the backstory here. Cause I think this is helpful. Who is John? John, John is like, Six months younger than Jesus himself. And, and they were born in the same area. And they grew up in the same area. And they had a similar kind of upbringing. Matter of fact, they were cousins. Okay? So that's how... I, I'm just imagining that they probably played together. They grew up together. They learned some things together. Maybe not all the time. But, I, you know, we're reading between the lines here. But, you know, they grew up in the same area. Mary had already made a, a habit of visiting Elizabeth... John's mother, and so, and Mary being Jesus' mother, and so there, there probably was some communication. And so, don't you know that at some point in their childhood, um, that their parents probably told them some crazy things about who they were? I mean, at some point, like, I don't think it was like, oh, suddenly they're 30 years old, and like, I mean, this was like decades of growing up in their youth years and their young, and, and, you know, Jesus was already beginning to get an awareness at 12 years old as he entered into his father's house, as he puts it. And so they knew some things. And John probably was not an exception there. Elizabeth and, uh, and Zechariah, they probably spoke to him and said, now, here's the crazy thing. One, uh, hey, son, you were a bit of a miracle. We were visited by an angel. And the angel even told us that your name was going to be John, and he told us what you were going to do. And you were going to be the one to cry out in the wilderness and to, to point the way to the Messiah, to Jesus. How about that, son? Not, you're, going to, you're Bo Nix, and you're going to be the next football star at Auburn. That's who you're going to be, I mean, because that's, that's what happened to Bo. <laughs> it's like, Bo was going to play at Auburn whether he was a one-star or a five, five-star prospect. You know what I'm saying? John the Baptist was going to point the way to the Messiah, whether he liked it or not. I mean, that's who he was, and he grew up knowing this. And Jesus probably had some similar conversations with his parents, but about his purpose. Can you imagine? So then, you know, they, they loved to ski together, and, you know, out on Lake, you know, the, the Sea of Galilee, they probably did some fishing together, and they were probably in a couple of tournaments, and, you know, caught striper and some, you know, bass, and you know, the. They probably spent a good bit of time together. I can just imagine anyway. And so don't you know that at some point they had some really weird cousin conversations? Hey, cuz, what's up? Can you imagine the moment when Jesus looked over at John and, you know, son's going down and he's fishing and he's reeling it in. And, you know, he looks over and he's like, John, guess what, dude? I'm, I'm God. You know, just fishing. Fishing for fish right now. Later, fishing for men. <laughs> I don't know. Like, and, and, then, and then John, cousin, was like, oh, well, how about that? Guess what? I have a similar story. I'm the one who was prophesied about for a thousand years, and I'm, point, I'm, I'm the one that's going to tell Israel about you. How about them apples? Oh, cool. So it was like, I, I imagine there was some kind of conversation <clears throat> that went on. And so they were, they, they, you know, I mean, they were, they were family. They, they had similar purpose, similar desire in their hearts to see, to see God's kingdom come to this earth. And then, you know, they got a little bit older. And at some point, John left and he went into the wilderness and started doing really strange things and dressing weird and eating weird. And, and then he started preaching and his ministry was growing. He had his own followers, his own disciples. He had people who were hanging around where he was and he started baptizing people and his ministry was growing and people were repenting of their sins and confessing and it was unbelievable. And then, and then at some point it was like, okay, now's the time. And, and, 
And then it's like, I can just imagine, you know. So now Jesus is walking along the edge of the Jordan. And John the Baptist, we talked about this. John the Baptist is baptizing people. And he looks up and it's like they make eye contact. And it's like Jesus is saying, now's the time. Let's do it. That's the one, you know, and he starts pointing. And that's the one. He's the Messiah. And he's so convinced. Don't you know he's so convinced? But then it's like he had to pass the torch. We talked about how crucial this must have been for him, like how difficult. And his disciples, his own disciples were like, you sure? Like, you're really that sure? You're just going to let all this go? Yeah, I'm passing the torch. It's not about me anymore. It's no longer about me. And sure enough, he, he told them, he said, Jesus must become greater. Now I've got to become less. It's not about me anymore. And he passes it on. And that's how convinced he was. I don't know what it would take for your cousin to convince you that they are the son of God. John was convinced. John was convinced, and he believed it. But then the scenery begins to change. Jesus begins his ministry. He comes back from, you know, he gets baptized. He, he spends 40 days in the wilderness, and then he starts doing the same. Talked some about that last week. And then when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison. Now, here's what's interesting. Not the fact that he got put in prison, because John got put in prison <laughs> several times. <clears throat> It's what he got put in prison for this time. This time he had really messed up because he went to some influ influential kind of political figures in Jerusalem and he was pointing to their sin and letting everybody know it. And he did it often. I mean, this was dangerous stuff. And, and so a little background on who they were. So this was the, the king of, of really kind of the you know, pseudo king almost. He was more of like a you know, governor, but, but he was king of Israel at the time and it was... Um, Herod Antipas, and, and then he had a brother named Herod Philip, and they were both uh, sons of King Herod the Great, who you've heard of from the Christmas story. We'll probably talk about him in several weeks. Um, but these were the sons, a, a couple of the sons, and Herod Philip, Herod Antipas, and then what's really weird is they had a niece named Herodias. Well, Herod Philip married his niece, Herodias. Yeah. And I know, we're from Alabama, so it's like, eh, what's the big deal? <laughs> I, I don't know. But, but he marries his niece, but, but it gets stranger than that, because then he's off on like a business trip, and Herodias has an affair with her other uncle, <laughs> King Herod Antipas, and then they end up getting married. And so it was just a, a debacle. It was crazy. And everybody's tweeting about it. Everybody knows about it and is aware of this egregious sin that they're living in, and yet it's okay. Everybody's just kind of buying it. Well, John is like calling them out, starts preaching about it, calling out their sin. And Herodias didn't like it. Now, Antipas, Herod Antipas didn't care, you know, he, he, was, he was impartial. Herodias, not a fan, did not like it, had him arrested and put him in prison. But not just any prison. It wasn't like he was in, you know, a prison in Jerusalem. This is what's unique. He was placed in a prison in, called Machaerus out in the middle of the Judean desert. Okay? Isolated from everything. In other words, when you got sent there, you were sent there to die. Like that was the end. And that's where he was placed. And then, and then when Jesus heard that, he heard that he, he you know, like, oh, John, my cousin, he's in Machaerus. Well, he withdrew to Galilee, leaving Nazareth, which is in Galilee. He went and lived north of that in Capernaum, which was by the lake. Now here, that didn't mean a lot to us unless you think about what a, kind of the map here. And so if you've got the Jordan River here, and you've got kind of northern Israel, southern Israel. Well, Machaerus was located kind of on that eastern border, near, kind of near the Jordan. And that's where Machaerus was. So he's in prison out in the desert here. Well, then, you know, Jesus was doing ministry, had begun things in Galilee. Well, then, then, then Jesus, what he does is he goes up and he goes and lives in Capernaum, which was northwest of there, on the northwest corner of, of the lake. He went in the opposite direction. Now, I, that, that should mean something to us. It's like, oh my goodness, I have found out that my cousin has been put in prison. I am the savior of the world. He has given up his life at this point. I mean, just has given everything up in order to point people to me. Don't you, don't you know, like it was at least would, would have been courteous for Jesus to go down and, and at least visit, take him a hot meal, chicken pot pie, something. But he doesn't. He goes north and he starts doing ministry there. Went and lived in Capernaum. 
And this is where I want to pick the story up because I think some doubt started to creep in into John's heart. Listen to what happens. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12, his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. His ministry began to grow. Time is passing. Months turn into a year, even a year and a half, some think. And when John, who was still in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent, this is like several chapters later, and John's still in prison. He sent his disciples to ask him. In other words, John sent his disciples to ask something of Jesus. So what's going on? Why does he do that? Well, he's been in prison now for a year and a half. And Jesus, he's heard about Jesus doing some crazy stuff. Jesus has been walking on water. He's been healing people. He's been feeding thousands of people. He's been doing unbelievable things, setting the captive free. And yet his cousin John, all the while, is chilling in prison. Now, I don't know if that bothers you, but it should a little bit because I think it would bother you if this was your situation, if this was your circumstance. And John, sure enough, was wondering. And he, and he was just, it's like, this is not what I expected. And so he sends his disciples to ask Jesus a question. They had been asking it all along, but now John is asking, Are you the one? What? Are you the one? Who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? What happened? What happened? I mean, between the guy who said, this is the one I have seen and I, test and I testify. This is God's chosen one. Jesus must become greater. I must become less. And now, a year and a half later, he's thinking, well, but did I get it right? This is his cousin. It's like he's known about it probably most of his life, most of his adult life anyway. Surely he's known before now, and he's been confident up to this point, but now he's, now he's wondering. Why? Why do you think he's wondering? It's because he had presuppositions about what the Messiah should or shouldn't do. Because he's heard what Jesus is doing. Spending all his time in Galilee hanging around a bunch of sinners and tax collectors and irreligious people. You know, so like, you know, here he is, John is confronting people, confronting the religious authorities who are in sin and, and those who are in political positions of influence. He's confronting them and he's pointing out sin. And it's like, Jesus, why aren't you doing that? I mean, why aren't you in the religious epicenter? I know it's great risk to you, but my goodness, isn't that what we're about? We're about revolution. We're about starting something. Like, why aren't you there doing that? Why are you spending all your time with these broken, kind of messed up nobodies? Don't you know that's what he was wondering? Why in the world? And here I am. I mean, don't you know we could be like a team, bro? Cuz... We could do great things. I could be your right-hand man. I mean, we could be, you know, I could be baptizing people while you're out healing people. Like, it would be like a two-for-one. Like, that, wouldn't that be better? I mean, he, he's presupposing. He's looking through what his understanding is, looking at his circumstance through that grid and making assumptions about who Jesus is or isn't. Did, did you follow that? And so what does Jesus do? Well, he tells these disciples of John, he says, I want you to go back to him and I want you, I just want you to tell him, remind him of what all I'm doing. Remind him of what you've seen and what you've heard about me, that I'm healing people, that the lame are walking, the blind can see, the captive is being set free. Maybe don't tell him that, you know, don't tell him that one. Um, just tell him the stuff that I've been doing. Remind him of who I am. In other words, Jesus says, just remind John of everything that I'm doing for everybody else. And that's exactly how you feel sometimes. That's how I feel sometimes. You felt that way, or you do feel that. Maybe you're going through that season right now, whatever that may be. You're going through the season, and you feel like you're stuck out in a desert prison by yourself, isolated, and Jesus, if he is really there, he's certainly not coming to your rescue. And he's nowhere to be found, and he's certainly being quiet, and you're not hearing from him, and you don't know what he's doing, and you're looking at your situation, you're thinking, well, goodness gracious, if you're paying attention, it sure doesn't seem like it. You're sure not letting me know it. If you really care, well, then why don't you seem like you care? If you really love me, then what's going on? 
And John felt that way. And so then this is the part, though, that's so powerful. Jesus wraps this little statement up with this. And he says, but blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. What? what, what? Blessed is anyone who keeps trusting me in spite of me. Blessed is anyone who trusts in who I am, not who you think I, or not what you think I should or shouldn't do. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble, who doesn't get tripped up on the things that I am doing or I'm not doing in your life. You're just confident in what? In me. In other words, trust Jesus more than your ability to interpret your circumstances. Not easy to do. But that's what Jesus is asking John to do. I, I just want you to... John, you know who I am. You know what I'm capable of. You, you know what my purpose is. You know what my calling is. You've known it for a long time. You've pointed people to me. You've done your part. You've played your part. You know exactly who I am. So just trust in that, not what you see me doing or not doing. In other words, trust in the character of God, not in the activity or inactivity of God. Oh yeah, God, God is gracious and merciful and kind and good and loving and full of purpose and vision. And he's for me, not against me. And he cares for me. And he challenges me. And he fills me with faith in his spirit. God is above all things. He is the creator of the universe. And he is my sustainer. And he believes in me. That's who God is. Not my presuppositions about what he should be doing or what it seems like he's not doing. But that's easier said than done, and I get that. It's easier said than done because, because you're walking through something or you've gone through something in the past, and it's why you ended up walking away from faith, because doubt crept in, because there was not 100% certainty about anything in this life, and so you feel like you're in left field all by yourself. I'm stuck in this desert prison, and I don't know what to do. I'm in this season, this circumstance, and all I'm thinking is this, and you, maybe you've been there. It just seems like God isn't listening, he's absent, or maybe he just doesn't care at all. That's how you feel. And guess what? We've been there. We've done that. We understand. And, and I don't know what it is for you. Maybe, maybe for you it's, it's a marriage that feels like it's falling apart. I mean, that, that could be where you are. Your marriage feels like it's falling apart. It's not doing well. It feels like there's no hope. You've tried everything. It's not going to get better. Maybe it's a job or a career and just things have not worked out like you thought they would, like you, like you hoped they would, your education, whatever it is. And, just, and it just doesn't look like there's any way for it to get better. Maybe, maybe you've lost someone. So you've lost someone you loved. And, and it was untimely, because it's always untimely. It was unexpected. And there's hurt and pain, unforgiveness that goes, on with, goes along with that. Maybe it's just a, a health issue. Somebody's sick, and they don't seem to be getting any better. Or there's chronic pain and there's the prognosis does not look good. Like there's just really no cure. There's no help that, you know, just things don't look good. And you're in a season and it's difficult and you feel isolated and stuck. And it feels like God is nowhere to be found. And you've been praying about it and you've been faithful, but nothing is happening. Can I just remind you of something today? I just want to remind you of a couple of things. First, this God can handle that. It's okay. God can handle your doubt and your anger and your frustration and your blame and your accusations. God can handle that. He's big enough to handle that. that that's on the one hand. It's like, I, I'm just seeing things and I feel like it should be this way and I am mad about it. Maybe something, I mean, I'll just let you know, I'll be real honest. I have prayed multiple times over the course of the last year and a half for COVID to just be eradicated. I've heard pe people have been praying about this for, for months now. 
for a long time. Christians all over the country, all over the world. I mean, we've been praying specifically. God, would you just eliminate this? And yet we're all thinking, but it hadn't happened yet. And people have died and people have have gone through difficult seasons and have gone through something. I mean, it just like, what's good about this? It's like, God, where are you? Have you felt that way? I mean, whatever it is, whatever you're walking through, I, it's, it would be very easy to say, this is the grid. I'm seeing things. I've prayed about it. I'm just, a, and you haven't done it, at least not on my timeline. I prayed on Monday. I thought it should be answered by like Wednesday. Hadn't happened yet. And so I'm angry frustrated but at the same time let's be reminded of this and this is what Jesus was reminding John of and he was I believe reminding you and I of that God is always with you see these two things are okay to believe but you've got to have both it's okay to be frustrated and to be angry to be mad you know it's like I don't understand but but I also know that God's with me I know who God is I know that he is faithful and that I can trust in him completely and that he's got me right where he is for me. He loves me. I don't understand what's going on. You see, this is the way that faith continues to be built because there's doubt and there's insecurity and a lack of confidence. And it's always going to be there on this side of heaven as long as you are inside that flesh, fleshly body of yours. But at the same time, Faith says, but I just know who Jesus is. I just know who he is. I don't understand what's going on right now, but I know who Jesus is. I don't don't like what's going on right now, but I know who Jesus is. I'm really upset by by this tragedy, and I don't see how this is going to get better, but I just know who Jesus is. That's the difference. And for the Christian, for the Christian... It's just knowing that something happened that eliminates the possibility that God doesn't know you by name. You know what that event is? It's the cross. You see, it's believing something as simple as this, that God actually loved loved you so much that he sent his only son to come and to put on flesh so that If you trusted in him, in him, not what he could do for you, not what he is doing or isn't doing, not what, not, not based on what you think he should do or shouldn't do or how active he is in your life or whether or not you think he cares. That's not what he's asking you to trust in. He just wants you to trust in him. Then you'll have life eternal with him, life everlasting. In other words, your faith is in who Jesus is. Not what he has or hasn't done. It's in the event that took place on the cross. To to know, to believe that Jesus put his put his life on the line literally for you in the midst of your sin, knowing you just like you are, as you are, and who you are, and still died for you anyway, knowing that should eliminate the confusion. I don't understand. And, and man, I, it's not like I go to somebody and I say, quit acting like you're hurting. My goodness, Jesus died for you. I mean, that's not it. Like, that's not pastoral. It's more like, I get it. I've been there. I've experienced this. I know exactly what you're saying. But at the same time, I just want to remind you, God is always with you. He's never, he has never left your side. He is with you. He is for you. He loves you. He cares for you. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget. He gave his life for you. Don't you know he knows your name? He knows your name. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, my prayer is that we would hear these words today, that we would be moved, that we would be changed, that we would not leave today unchanged but that you would just do a work in each of us. Those that need to hear that, give us wisdom to hear your words, your words, not mine, your words. And then give us the courage to act on them. And maybe that's just as simple as just anteing back up in our faith and just saying, God, I just want to put my faith in you again. I've recognized I've started to put my faith in myself and I've put my faith in what I thought you should or shouldn't do or 
what I thought you could or couldn't do. I, instead, I, I'm just reminded today, I need to put my faith just in you and who you are. Would you teach us to do that today? And then if you'll just keep your heads bowed for just a minute, I want to speak to those in here who are not following Jesus currently. You, don't, you, don't have, you, you've, you haven't put your faith in Jesus. Maybe you're online. You've never done that before. But, but maybe today you recognize that it's just, what's been holding you back are the doubts and the questions, and, and that's okay. I get that. But having those answered will never make things okay for you. It's ultimately just deciding, but it's Jesus that I'm putting my faith in. And I want to I give you an opportunity to do that today, to just let go, to let go. Of the expectations, the assumptions, the presuppositions about what God is or what he isn't or what he should or shouldn't do. But instead, just the fact that he's with you and that he loved you so much that he gave his son for you. I just want to invite you. You can pray with me right where you are. Something like this. Heavenly Father, I confess that I am a sinner. I need a savior. I believe his name is Jesus. And I don't understand everything. And I still have questions. But I want to put my faith in who you are. And I believe that you are my Savior. And that you died for me. And so I give you my life. I give you my all. And ask you to be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name. Mm -hmm.